Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming to today's talk, which is the final talk of my intern, Srinivas. And thank you for watching for those who are online. Srinivas is a third year PhD student in the University of Texas of, of Dallas. His supervisor is Associated Professor Carlos Busso, and his PhD topic is apparently on use, detecting and utilizing the emotions, human emotions in human computer interfaces, uh, generally targeted as effective computing. Today, he will present the results from his three months long internship in the audio and acoustics research group. Without further ado, Srinivas, you have the floor. Thank you, thank you, Ivan. So uh, my name is Srinivas Patsarti. So I'm from UT Dallas. I, uh, my advisor is Carlos Busso. And here I was part of the uh, audio and acoustics group. I'm going to, as Ivan put it, a snapshot of my work over the last three months, uh, which was on uh, speech emotion recognition with a uh, convolutional neural network. OK, so uh, this is going to be the outline. And I'm going to start with some background on uh, emotions such. OK, so when we look at uh, emotion representation, there are uh, two popular ways to uh, represent. Uh, one is categorical, where you have uh, discrete classes of emotions, such as neutral anger, happiness, sadness. And also, uh, another representation is through attributes mainly uh, activation and valence, which is activation is how aroused a person is going from calm to excited. And uh, valence says how positive or negative an emotion is. We also have uh, dominance power uh, or power and uh, expectation. Um, so to continue on that, this uh, picture pretty much provides a good view of how to map the attributes with the classes. So on the horizontal axis, you have valence where you go from very negative to very positive. And uh, on the vertical axis, uh, on the vertical side, you have arousal, which is uh, uh, very active to very passive. And you see how these different classes fall within uh, uh, the spectrum. And uh, uh, neutral is somewhere in the middle, and happy is highly aroused and positive, whereas angry is uh, uh, negative and highly aroused as well. So uh, these labels are generally collected as uh, through perceptual evaluations, where you have evaluators watching a clip and listening to it and giving labels. And uh, obviously, uh, these labels are fuzzy. Uh, I wouldn't call them noisy, because uh, it's more bias uh, in, in, in terms of the evaluators. So they, they come in with a bias and uh, culturally and other things. and. Uh, so they're not exactly noisy, but more fuzzy. And uh, obviously, the attributes, the attribute scales uh, provides better granularity as such. So you can have different types of anger within that and different scales of happiness. But uh, the classes are uh, straightforward and easy to understand. OK, so going on to uh, speech-based uh, uh, utterance uh, emotion classification. They're generally, you have the speech signal, and then you, uh, 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 you capture these uh, or extract frame level uh, features, which are captured over every 25 millisecond uh, window and then shifted by 10 milliseconds. And these range from, you, you have like uh, multiple features here, but you look at energy and pitch spectral features and uh, uh, many more uh, uh, low level features. And uh, then, you have some representation for it. You do some feature selection, or you use a DNN to represent these features. And uh, then you find statistics over the entire utterance. And uh, these are, uh, now you have, uh, you introduce the invariance, and you have a fixed representation for the entire utterance. And uh, these are called high level functionals, generally. And then you, the classifier sits on top uh, uh, to get the emotional state. OK, so moving on, I'm going to now talk about uh, uh, the data set and the baseline that was used for uh, my project here. Uh, 
so I'm, uh, we were interested in uh, speech-based emotion recognition, although there are multiple modalities. Uh, speech is the most common one, obviously. And uh, uh, we are, again, interested in classifying it into uh, discrete classes, as you saw earlier. We're not uh, looking at continuous uh, uh, classification, but over discrete utterances as such. Uh, uh, one problem that we have generally is with uh, everyday interactions, which, natural interactions, which tend to be more neutral than having a highly emotional uh, and data. So uh, most data sets that are available on, uh, that are available uh, are uh, generally acted to get the emotions or, and most natural databases are, uh, you don't have a good distribution of the emotions. So we were looking at the GOS corpus, which has uh, around 7,000, 17,000 sentences that have been annotated, and this is in Mandarin. And uh, people are interacting with the chatbot here. So you can see the distribution uh, distribution of the emotions. You see you have a lot of happy emotions talking to, talking to the chatbot, and uh, there's imbalance. There's not that much sadness here. Okay, so in terms of the annotation, uh, this was done with perceptual evaluation and uh, uh, crowdsourced through UHRS. We have five raters for each utterance and uh, four emotional classes, happy, neutral, angry, and sad, the distribution as such. So uh, looking at the annotations, uh, first, if you look at having a majority class, having three out of five raters uh, agree on a particular emotion, uh, we have uh, human performance here to be around 75%. So you see it's fuzzy already. We, the best human performance with this is 75%. And uh, so, and if we remove uh, cases such as uh, three people agreeing on one, one class and two people agreeing on another, we, we were able to increase the human performance to 82%, but we, re we lose around um, 6,500 samples. Uh, doing that. So the problem itself is uh, inherently difficult uh, due to these fuzzy labels. So please do stop me if you have any questions. Uh, yeah. uh, just looking at the uh, rate of agreement. So having a, if, if, I, if I just have a majority class from the five raters, so this is just the rate of agreement. Um, Yes. Is it one sentence? Yes, it's each utterance. Each utterance is annotated for, for the emotion. So they are short between one and six seconds. One and six seconds, okay. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I'll talk about the baseline that we'll be comparing the performance with. And uh, this was done by an intern uh, who was here last summer, uh, um, John Q. Uh, so for first, the frame level features, you, uh, the, the low level descriptors, the frame level features, 29 features are extracted. So you have a 26 log melt spectrogram. So just quickly to explain the melt scale to people who are not aware of it. Uh, it is a way to, uh, it's a perceptual uh, measure uh, of the frequency where you say, pitches are equidistant to the listeners. Uh, so it is a log scale of the frequency, and it is captured with these, uh, generally with these triangular windows. And uh, you have, uh, you can basically have multiple bands, and the energy in each band uh, is what makes the, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the log melt spectrogram. So, uh, we use the 26 log mel we use 26 uh, bands so 26 windows 26 log mel spectrogram energy pitch and voice probability so these were the uh, low level features that were used uh, silence frames in, in each speech utterance uh, was removed with a vad and uh, along with the features the deltas were added so you had 58 features and generally for uh, to get a context uh, for emotion, we use the 25 frame uh, context window. So at 
frame rate of 10 milliseconds, this is around uh, 250 milliseconds. So where uh, you can get a good measure of the emotion, at least. Uh, and uh, for the 58 features, so this comes to around 1450 features per frame. Okay, so for the feature representation itself, uh, for the baseline we have uh, a fully connected layer, four fully connected layers with 512 nodes. And this is for each frame. So for each frame you have uh, four fully connected layers, 512 nodes. Uh, at the at the top of these, uh, at the top you have a mean pooling. You have a mean pooling layer to introduce the invariance and to make uh, all utterances fixed length, basically. And then uh, for the classifier, initially for in the baseline a softmax was uh, used, and then uh, after optimizing it with the softmax, this was replaced by a extreme learning machine ELM. Surprisingly, this gave uh, a far superior performance compared to the softmax, which has to do basically with the data set, I guess. With a smaller data set, it has a better representation and a better generalization. Okay, so uh, quickly going through the evaluation uh, parameters for the baseline. So as you saw earlier, we have only 10,500 utterances. So the 6,500 utterances were removed since there was uh, no majority there. And uh, so with that, the human agreement is around 82%. 75% of this was used for training, 15% for validation, and 15 for testing. So since the data set, was, since the data set is hugely imbalanced, uh, we calculate both the weighted and unweighted accuracy. So weighted accuracy uh, is where the class weights are obviously maintained, so it's the overall accuracy. We have around 40% for happiness, so if all classes are predicted as happy, you're going to have 40% performance, basically. Whereas when we look at the unweighted accuracy, no class weights, it's the average accuracy per class, basically. And this is also the unweighted recall. So uh, still staying with the baseline, cross entropy with one hot labels, that's what uh, we use for uh, uh, the loss. And the validation and early stopping was done only on the weighted accuracy, right? So this is the performance on the baseline. Um, so you have uh, weighted accuracy on the right and unweighted accuracy on the left. And uh, you have the confusion matrix here. And uh, a common phenomenon with emotion recognition for speech uh, is distinguishing valence or positive and negative, which here would be uh, uh, identifying uh, negative classes, negative uh, emotions as such, which would be sad and neutral. You would have more confusion there, separating sad and neutral. And if you look at the confusion matrix here, you see sad and neutral. There's a, a big confusion there. Whereas uh, distinguishing happy and, uh, happy and angry, you have a similar problem. All right, so the unweighted accuracy is around 54.9, and the weighted accuracy is 63. So our, one of the biggest concerns that we address here is the huge difference between uh, unweighted accuracy and weighted accuracy. There have been other studies that do uh, weighted cross entropy, but uh, while they increase the unweighted accuracy, there's a big drop in weighted accuracy in those studies. And uh, obviously we would like to uh, uh, maintain the original distribution as well. So we would like to have uh, good un uh, weighted accuracy. Okay, so this was the uh, baseline. And now I'm, I, I want to talk about some uh, initial experiments uh, that I did. So uh, the first thing I did, uh, first thing that we looked at was uh, to use the original probability distribution from the raters rather than using the one hot label. So uh, this, uh, we believe, is a better representation of the fuzzy labels. And also the second added advantage here is you don't have to discard the 6500 samples. Of course, the big limitation is how are we going to use this at testing? How are we going to evaluate this at testing? So for now, it's, it's, it's just added to training and with the original representation. I'll show that this uh, gives a better unweighted accuracy as you see here. So, and then we tried uh, uh, using uh, a different number of nodes uh, and we saw that uh, increasing more than 1024, there was a drop in performance and Layer size between two to four, uh, we got similar performance and greater than four, we were overfitting. So, uh, uh, 
And uh, we stayed with the softmax rather than moving on to the ELM. And uh, so you, here you see the initial experiment. So using the one hot label, you have uh, unweighted accuracy and weighted accuracy 53 and 56, which is much lesser than the baseline. And just using the rated distribution as such, we immediately get a jump in performance, uh, which this is without adding the extra data even. And adding the extra data, we get a even bigger improvement. And I will be comparing uh, the unweighted accuracy plus the weighted accuracy to see, uh, to, sh to show that uh, we're, we're looking to increase both rather than uh, uh, just one of them. And uh, the early stopping now was done on both the unweighted accuracy plus the weighted accuracy, right? And uh, so with 512 nodes, two layers, uh, softmax and uh, the extra data, we already see a better weighted accuracy, uh, unweighted accuracy, and a small drop in weighted accuracy. So this number is acts as a, another baseline that I'll be comparing the. Uh, so, my, yes. So baseline to row number two, right? Right. So is it supposed to reduce, or you, do you expect it to increase? No, I, I, I expect it to increase with the rate of distribution, using the rate of distribution as such, the Not probability. Just one heart. Not just one heart. Yes. And I, we do see that. So why does one heart get lesser than the baseline? Uh, uh, ELM, I think, does a better job at uh, generalizing it for the small data set. And, uh, and it's four layers. And oh, four, four layers, layers are the difference. Yeah. Okay. And we, uh, using even four layers here, uh, it, it's not a big jump. But it's two layers, right? Five, two yes, yes, yes. That I, I did try it with up to four layers, but uh, two layers gave like a similar performance. So I, I stuck with that. So the difference is basically... <coughs> yes. The ELM on top adds a big difference. That's right. Okay. So the next thing we did was to uh, uh, use the context. Obviously, emotion has, uh, uh, can be captured with context uh, uh, that's there in speech. And... Uh, so to do that, we use the recurrent neural network, um, a BLSTM architecture with uh, two layers and 185 units. To, so I, all these units were matched so that we had the same number of parameters. Uh, right, so BLSTM to, cap to capture both the uh, past and uh, future information. So, so here, to correspond to our uh, initial block diagram, the XT is act as, act, act as the low-level features. So we are still using the same features, the 26 log mel spectrogram, energy, pitch, and the voice probability. And uh, the output from the, uh, the hidden layer, uh, uh, the output, uh, the hidden layer of the uh, BLSTM acts as our feature representation, and then you have the output layer, right? And uh, similar to uh, the DNN, global mean pooling uh, to get a fixed length representation and then a classifier on top, right? We're always using the softmax. So we tried uh, doing mean pooling and weighted mean, which I'll talk about in the next slide, and also the statistics, which I don't report here, where we take the max, min, mean, and uh, yeah, we, we, we basically take those four. How many iterations did you try? Uh, this was, uh, you mean like how many epochs? Over, uh, I tried with 100 epochs and it was stopped on uh, the uh, uh, unweighted accuracy plus weighted accuracy was my uh, uh, early stopping. Okay. Right. So uh, again, we removed silence regions here. They provide no information uh, uh, on the emotion as such. So we used the VAD to remove that. And uh, so talking about the weighted pooling, uh, so this is attention-based weighting. So, uh, which was uh, uh, done by Matt, another intern who was here last year. So, uh, so the weights for the attention is learned along with the, so instead of just doing mean here, we, we add weight, weights for these, and that's learned along with the network, which is basically what attention is. So, we see the mean pooling with softmax uh, doesn't really improve compared to the uh, fully connected layer. And then weighted mean, actually, the performance drops. It's worse than uh, what we had with, with just the RNN. So our, uh, but the, the main thing, I think, that, that's uh, happening here is 
because these are short speech utterances and uh, carefully segmented as well. So I don't think uh, the weighted mean uh, really improves the performance. And this was uh, observed in their uh, results as well, where just the mean pool mean pooling gave uh, as good performance as weighted mean. So, so RNNs obviously are performing worse than the uh, uh, the fully connected layers, right? So. Now I'll move on to the different CNN uh, architectures and uh, features that I try to uh, uh, to model emotion recognition. So, so the context window that we were using for the DNN, the 25 uh, frame context window, can be captured with the convolutional neural networks as such. Uh, and I will be doing temporal convolutions mainly. Right, so we have, uh, we, we, we st I started with the same number of, uh, the same features. So you have uh, 26 log mel, one energy, uh, the pitch and the probability of voicing, right? And these are different features that are stacked for each frame, right? And along with the deltas. So uh, we have 58 features for each frame and uh, variable length sequences. Right, uh, so the first thing we did with, uh, with these different features is to uh, use kernels that were uh, of width t and height 29. So uh, as we are stacking different features, it makes sense to uh, use a kernel height that was the entire feature, uh, feature length. So we are of, uh, oh sorry, this should be 58 with the deltas. So this was t comma 58, so that's the kernel size and uh, Basically, essentially, we are trying to do 1D convolution a long time. And we can, of course, handle uh, variable length sequences. So most studies that, uh, there have been a couple of studies that actually try to use CNNs for emotion recognition, but they generally crop the sequences and uh, they crop the most voice regions and without, uh, 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 but we don't, we don't do that. We don't, we don't stick to any cropping, but uh, we introduce the invariance by doing the mean pooling and the softmax, of course. So the, the width is, uh, we, I, we use the width of 24 frames, which is again, corresponds to 250 milliseconds. We use something that's closest to 250 milliseconds and this seems to give the best uh, uh, emotion representation. Others, we've done previous work on that as well, right? 250 milliseconds. So uh, the mini batch, we had 128 utterances per mini batch, learning rate of, uh, Tiny power minus four, and then uh, cross entropy and early stopping on um, unweighted plus weighted accuracy. Uh, uh, one thing that we do here, the spectral features, basically the log mel spectrogram is uh, mean normalized to remove the channel effects. These are, yeah. Uh, in the previous slide, yeah. there's no recurrence here, it's only mean. Yes, so we're, we're, uh, right now I'm just looking at a representation for the, with the CNN. So, we can all, uh, this, we, we, I haven't tried it with any RNNs on top. So this is basically only with the CNNs. But still think about this, it's so between one to six seconds uterus. You cannot expect some sequence and expect the transition from this to that state. This is why statistics across the timeline pretty much get us the same, uh, even better results. Yeah, and uh, going along that, we also tried, I mean, uh, the other studies have also tried, instead of doing mean pooling with the RNN, just take the final hidden state, and none of those give the give good results. So, uh, right, and the whole thing was implemented with uh, CNTK. Right, uh, so I, I, we, try, I, we tried some uh, different architectures for this. So the first thing is just one convolution layer, and then mean pooling on top and uh, softmax, this was the first architecture. So, uh, okay, baseline, and then you have the fully connected with this number is what we are going to compare with mostly. And, uh, okay, so one convolution layer is not enough to, to learn the representation. And uh, even with the number of parameters matched, this, there is a big drop in performance. Right, so, 
Okay, so the next architecture was to stop with the one convolution layer, but uh, add, uh, add a DNN on top. The big difference here between this and the, I mean, the fully connected layer. So the difference between this and the fully, uh, uh, the fully connected layer earlier is uh, uh, we do the invariance before the final layer. We add the fully connected layer after doing the mean pooling. But earlier we were, we, were, we had four layers of fully connected layers and then we uh, did the mean pooling there. Right, and uh, so with this, there is an even bigger drop, which is uh, which is not surprising actually, because uh, the uh, we lose a lot of information through the global mean pooling. So uh, in, while introducing the invariance, so there is a big drop when doing this. Okay, so uh, moving on. Okay, so the, the next idea was to have multiple resolutions, right? And uh, still we're, we're, we're looking at temporal resolutions here. So there are different characteristics that uh, uh, can be captured with uh, different resolutions, uh, we believe. And uh, uh, the shorter uh, resolution is kind of trying to detect some onset. So maybe laughter or high energy anger and uh, mainly high arousal uh, emotions can be captured, I believe, with, uh, with the shorter temporal uh, resolution and more stationary ones with a, with a longer resolution, right? So uh, we had uh, three resolutions in time, um, 16 frames. So that is the shortest one and then 24 frames, which is uh, what uh, was 240 milliseconds, which we had uh, earlier, and then uh, uh, 32 frames. So, and the rest of the architecture just remains the same. So, we're still uh, sticking to one global mean pooling and uh, a soft max. So, these three different frames were applied in the same model or there were three different models? No, in, in the same. Oh, okay. So, it's just one convolution layer with, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's in the same layer that we have like three times uh, resolutions and then we concatenate it over there. Right. Um, and, uh, right. So, okay. So, with, with the time resolution, with these uh, uh, three resolutions, uh, th there is a, there's a much better performance here, and uh, we are now performing better than the uh, the fully connected layer. Uh, and uh, again, it's the we're 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 pretty much trying to raise the unweighted accuracy, and uh, without dropping uh, weighted accuracy. And that is why I, I've been looking at this number, the the sum of unweighted accuracy and weighted accuracy. And uh, okay, so. This uh, architecture is basically what gave us the best performance, where we made it deeper, uh, three convolution layers with all with uh, uh, 24 frames. And uh, of course, the number of filters was uh, matched so that uh, we have the same number of parameters, was, which was chosen so that we have the same number of parameters. And then what was interesting was uh, adding a, a another convolution layer on top, but here we used a frame of just one. And surprisingly, this uh, seemed to give the best performance. Uh, not just making it deeper, but adding a layer where we had a, uh, a frame width of just one. So basically, this is acting like a fully connected layer for every frame on top, right? So, and then we do the mean pooling and uh, softmax. And okay, now now we see we we we've gone past the the baseline that we had with the ELM and four layers, and uh, the unweighted accuracy now is uh, much bigger than what uh, what we initially had, right? And uh, our weighted accuracy increases as well. Yeah, and uh, this is the architecture that we go past the baseline with the. Uh, uh, with the ELM. Okay, so the next thing we tried was uh, how about increasing the uh, uh, 
number of uh, bands that we have in the NEL spectrum. So we moved from 26 to 40, and this was, uh, again, we added the other features, the F0 energy and VAD probability with that. And uh, the, we, we're sticking to the same structure, but increasing the number of uh, 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 Frequency bands, it's it's not really it didn't really improve the results. So again, I I think we may be overfitting here with uh, by increasing the uh, uh, the number of uh, uh, log mil uh, frequency band. So, but uh, uh, com compared to the fully connected layer, we still have a similar performance, but uh, this is less than the twenty six log mil. Right, and uh, of course, so the next question is, how about having only the log mil spectrogram without the energy and or the pitch features, right? And now uh, we can also do, uh, as I'll show in the next slide. So first we, we still stuck with the 1D convolution, just temporal convolution. So the, the height of the kernel is still fixed at 26, right? And we, we only, move along the uh, variable length, which is time here, right? And we still stick to 24 frames. And when we do this, uh, the, the, the performance is uh, less than the fully connected layer. And, uh, and it's even obviously worse than, uh, so we do lose performance when we remove the pitch energy and uh, VAD features. But, uh, so the next thing we tried with only the log mil uh, features is to introduce three different types of uh, kernels here. So if you have one which is basically 32 by one. So this is, this is the long temporal window and uh, no frequency information. So it's capturing every frequency, uh, every frequency band separately. So you're not getting any frequency information here, but you're using a long temporal window. Uh, the next one is to, have no temporal information, but to have like a broad band. So this is similar to NMF, where you, the window is all 26 log mil, but uh, only the frame width being just one. And also have some sub band and uh, temporal windows. So this is proper 2D convolution with, with this window. And uh, so this is 24, 24 width and eight, the height for the uh, uh, for the kernel, and uh, all strides are one, which is basically a parameter in CNTK that I we are not able to change. So all strides were done uh, in time and frequency with, uh, but they were just moved by one. And uh, and top of this, we added another CNN layer, which is basically what we did. Uh, in the earlier cases where it's just a 1D temporal convolution. So with that, uh, with the multi-resolution, and without, and remember we have, we're adding no other features here. This is just the log mil spectrogram and we have, and we, we, we've gone past the uh, fully connected layer already. Okay, and uh, the other thing was, how about not using the mel scale and just using uh, the linear spectrogram? So no mel scale conversions, and we tried uh, two different windows, of length 256, 512, and we had a 50% overlap. Uh, hand windows, and uh, again, these were just, we just did uh, 1D convolutions and with no VAD. Uh, uh, so even, even with that, uh, with just the linear scale spectrograms we, and with no VAD, we're getting a pretty decent performance with, uh, in terms of uh, um, using 256 uh, length windows. But with 512, this, this drops drastically. So this shows that uh, we need to have better resolution uh, temporally and uh, we don't need a huge resolution in terms of frequency. Okay, so so far we've 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 just been doing uh, global mean pooling. So this is uh, uh, as such, this is just a bag of words model. 
where you have just one feature representation on top. So we decided how about changing that and uh, uh, do sort of pyramidal pooling. So pyramidal pooling was introduced in this paper and uh, instead of having one, rep one fixed length representation on top, you can uh, divide sequences into fixed number of bins but varying lengths because we have a variable length sequence in the beginning. So uh, we believe this is a better fixed length representation than just doing uh, global mean pulling on top or doing cropping, right? And uh, so we used the best CNN structure that we had and uh, tried two different types of uh, pyramidal pooling uh, where you had uh, 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 four divisions. So four by one, three by one, two by one, and one by one, which basically corresponds to just doing global mean pooling or bag of words. And we also tried six by one, three by one, two by one, and uh, one by one, right? Um, okay, so with that, um, okay, so we have the two pyramidal pooling layers here. And uh, okay, so this is where we really see uh, a big jump in performance. So this is the best CNN architecture, which already was above the baseline, both in uh, the original baseline as well as the baseline with the fully connected layer. So we had around 2% uh, improvement in performance when we, when we compared with the CNN and the fully connected layer. But when we introduce the pyramidal pooling, we get 2.5 and almost 5%. Uh, so this is like 4.65. So okay, now, <laughs> There's a big jump in the uh, unweighted accuracy, and uh, we don't drop much in the weighted accuracy with respect to the baseline. So we have, this is where we see the uh, uh, biggest gains in terms of unweighted accuracy. Okay, so as a preliminary test, we also, <laughs> towards the last period of my internship and still going on actually. We we're trying to see if uh, we can introduce some uh, cross-language emotion recognition. So, so far we've been looking only at uh, uh, the Mandarin data set. And uh, we annotated, uh, uh, we annotated some utterances from the Cortana data set where people are uh, talking to Cortana. And uh, we annotated around 5,000 utterances here and you see the uh, imbalance in the data set. Almost 97% of these utterances were neutral. So absolutely no, no emotional information at all. So I guess Cortana has no personality as such. So. Yeah, but if you have a classifier which always gives neutral, you have 97% <laughs> <laughs> right. so, so what we did was to uh, add the utterances uh, from the Cortana data set to the training set in the uh, Xiaowai's Chinese corpus. So uh, same four classes here, and we added uh, 5,000 utterances from this uh, to the already, uh, uh, to the training set from the uh, other language. And, uh, and this was just the best CNN model that we had. Uh, and so this was very surprising that uh, cross language, adding, adding data from another language actually improves the performance. And uh, uh, I mainly think this is uh, due to the large amount of neutral data that's being added. So uh, there's a better recognition between uh, sadness and neutral when we, when we look at uh, Geo-wise, when we add this data. And the other surprising thing was this converged much faster. So I was able to, the convergence was around like 20 epochs, I got the same loss. Whereas there I was looking at around the same loss that was at 50, 60 epochs. So uh, with this, uh, we were able to converge faster as well. Okay, to summarize the different architectures and results that we have, so that is the fully connected layer with, uh, with the ELM and uh, 512 by four. So 118.1 there. And so initially adding just the extra data and using the rated distribution as such. So the rated distribution contributes mainly to the unweighted accuracy, improvement in unweighted accuracy. And uh, 
So this is the baseline with the fully connected layer. RNNs, no real improvement in performance. Uh, the base CNN model, yes, of course, uh, improvement in performance with respect to the fully connected layer as well as the uh, baseline. And uh, okay, pyramidal pooling, the best pyramidal pooling, which gives the maximum improvement in performance. Spectrograms, uh, not so much. Uh, but of course, there is no VAD involved here. And uh, there is, like, there is, we are pretty apprehensive that spectrograms give us all the information that we need with respect to emotion. And uh, uh, and with the cross language, again, there's a surprising improvement compared to uh, the baseline. Okay, so to, to list the contributions as such, the first thing was to use the evaluator probability distribution as such, which is better at capturing the fuzzy labels. Uh, imbalance in data set addressed with both the unweighted accuracy and weighted accuracy early stopping on that. Uh, we looked at various CNN model architectures and uh, features. Uh, pyramidal pooling, of course, to introduce the invariance, and that seems better than uh, global mean pooling. And uh, cross language, I believe, has uh, surprising potential moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Questions, colleagues? Yeah. Yeah, um, I'm not from the speech side, so I, this might be the dumb question, but um, so anyway, you are using features from, you're using handcraft features in speech side. Um, I mean, the images we are, uh, for example, is there any the low level feature, you can, low level signal you can use, for example, image, the reason why the company is successful is because you are using um, RGB pixels, which is lowest level we can go. And the same thing happened in the um, language size as well, because they try to do character level you know, inputs instead of word level. And sometimes you achieve good results. So in speech size, is there anything similar to like just maybe um, the waveform, the amplitude as such? It's the lowest level possible so that you can learn every feature from the net instead of putting our knowledge into that. Yes, network. there is work that is going on that. But uh, the spectrogram is, as such, a low level representation where you have both uh, time and frequency. Right. There is work done being uh, done on just taking the waveforms as such, and uh, so where you have only the energy, the amplitude of the waveform, and working on that. But uh, the spectrograms are the lowest. Uh, okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, so the speech not only contains the the, the, vo the, the voice, and also there is a context that you mentioned. There's like so there is like you can trans you can translate the voice into into sentences, and then you, you may, and then there's like existing algorithm where you can run sentiment analysis on the, on the sentences. So, so why didn't you include that into your model as another uh, feature or variable? So you, you only take into account of just the feature from the voice itself, right. but why not also the text? So we have done this in the previous project, which was stepping on Cortana uterus system. And then we also labeled 30,000 uteruses, but removed a lot of the neutral to get a little bit more bias, and still with 80% neutral. And we run our motion detection on the speech transcription, the output of the speech recognizer, and found a little correlation between the emotion in the voice and the emotion in the meaning of what you are saying. Our hypothesis at the time was that most probably the emotion in the voice when you talk to Cortana is inflicted by something outside of your dialogue with Cortana. Literally, kids running in the background, you are angry by something else, and literally, in Cortana case, nobody ever bothers to put emotions in his or her voice with that blue circle on your phone. In Shawa, it's, the, the, it's completely different because it's a kind of, first it's a dialogue, then it's a kind of a flirty chat with a better representation of the young female. And this 
causes us to think that the emotion when you talk with Cortana e, with Chao Ice is actually product of the conversation. And we do have the transcriptions. I may need the one inter who knows Chinese actually to sit and to start to work on that multi-model, multi-models emotion recognition when you utilize both the voice itself, the meaning, and eventually we may add the visuals later to have a better data set. And once we, we combine all of the modalities available, face, expression, gestures, voice, meaning of the text, I'm pretty sure that this fusion of those features will give us the best possible, the best possible emotion detection. At least this is what humans do. We struggle when we don't see the person we're talking with or to detect the emotion only from the face without knowing the voice, knowing the conversation, knowing the context. So when we say context here, we just think about a set of 25 consecutive audio, consecutive audio frames. This is it. Yeah. And, yeah. and also, uh, so you, when you run a spectrogram, uh, you, you, you delete the other frame that doesn't have any sound. You use VAD, right? Right, on the log map. Yeah, yes. yeah. Uh, so for me, when I'm, when I'm neutralized, sometimes I speak, I have more stopping time in, into my words. And uh, when I'm angry, I may, I may have, I may just give you all the words in, like, with non, yeah. uh, non-stop. Yeah. So I'm guessing you, the VAD probability that you include in your model, you, you consider this uh, scenario, right? Yes, uh, uh, the unvoiced then, yes, th there is a probability of the voicing when we include the VAD probability. Okay. Right. Yeah. But we don't but have don't... a sense of timing. Remember that. Yeah, like a, like a, like a VAD is going to be like the best approach. When, when you process segment by segment by segment, at the end of the classifier, you do statistics across the time frame and base it to, across the time and base it on this, you make the conclusion. It's a five second sentence not much information in the timing. Okay, go ahead. So, yeah, there was an on, there's an online question from one of the people, right? So, is, uh, are there psychoacoustical models to model, to generate synthetic data with emotion? Are you aware of Very any? Very good, yeah. Uh, I'm not aware of any. Uh, so, to generate synthetic emotions. Emotional data, like if you want to take any speech and add emotion to it synthetically, we could potentially generate a lot of training data useful for, you know, this kind of balancing the imbalance. Assuming that that text-to-speech engine is better than our classifier. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'm, I'm not aware of it. There are models, yeah, there are. There are tools? Yeah, we, yeah we're, we're working tools. on doing yes. this algorithm. Um, yeah, it's going to take some work. Yeah. So you're working on emotional recognition, but how about a different uh, scenario, emotion verification, that let's say happy versus neutral or angry versus neutral. This way you will not have as much of a bad data balancing problem, because I think in many applications, you are just interested in knowing if the person is different from neutral, right? So difference from neutral. Yeah. Uh, so treat it as a verification single, single problem. Yes, one class, one versus me. Two, two class. Two class, yeah. Uh, so there is work on that, actually, uh, but... Uh, what, what's the state of the art on, on that thing? State of the art for uh, I'm not uh, I, I'm not uh, familiar with the state of the art for one class versus I mean two class problem with the binary problem, but uh, it's around sixty percent for when you look at uh, arousal and valence as well. So saying positive versus negative, like which is hardest with audio. The valence is harder to uh, classify with audio, whereas uh, the arousal scale, saying active versus uh, passive. Uh, there is 70, 75 percent is the state of the art for. See, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about detecting 
some emotional state from you know, different from neutral. From neutral. So this can be done from utterance to utterance, or even in the same utterance, mm -hmm. a longer utterance, probably not from one to six seconds. Mm -hmm. But you know, this is so it's sort of like a monitoring of uh, you know long dialogues and see if at a certain point, the, you know, some of the you know people in the conversation have an emotional. Change. Yes. So uh, my other work, I, I do deal with uh, hotspots, but again, this is in the arousal valence scale. So saying when it is highly aroused and highly uh, calm compared to neutral, or the same thing with positive and negative. Uh, as such, classes uh, and there is work on the detection change of yeah. change in emotion as well. Uh, again, on a continuous basis. Uh, I see uh, the latest uh, the study that I can think of, uh, one that is done in uh, uh, University of New South Wales, where they were doing uh, change in uh, the, the detection of change of emotion, the point of change, more than. And so they were doing a, so there they were having a hit rate to see how ma how many false alarms and uh, uh, that they were getting. So there it was around 25 percent. That was the uh, that is the that's the paper that I can think of. That's the work that I can think of. Okay. So, there's also uh, another related uh, technical question about convolution. Right. Someone was mentioning about why not doing it at the raw signal level, right? So, if we do convolution in the raw signal domain, we know what it means. Right. But you are doing convolution on the smell capstro yeah. domain. I don't know what it means physically. That is true. So, this is more of Treating it like an image, yeah. right, so rather than uh, having a meaning for the convolutions themselves. I mean, I mean the feature, you know. So for image, if you do it right. on the pixel level, then of course you are doing spatial filtering. Right. right. So here we, we are again treating it like an image when when we when we uh, do the two D spectrogram, bell scale or linear scale. So. So, so you think we can detect emotions, uh, uh, emotions from images of speech. That is one way to look at it. <laughs> so that is what we tried and uh, I'm, I'm not really... Uh, Still, you're correct. There are a lot of questions around this. Technically, male filters and MFCCs are designed for speech recognition. Oh, and the holy grail of the speech recognition domain, is so. speaker independent, <clears throat> emotion independent speech recognizer. So technically those features, they try to mask identity, they try to mask emotions, so we can get extract the meaning of the speech. And suddenly they became the same feature set for speaker identification, for emotion detection, maybe because we do have a code base and can quickly extract them. It's, I don't think this is a closed question and we selected the future set for emotion detection. For speech recognition, yes. For anything else, hmm. yeah. let's well, think I mean, about this. You're using Thanks. a lot of segmental information, but on, on top of that, there's also supra-segmental information that's right. actually more related to emotion. Right. That is, of course, the brute force method of going about adding all these and then doing a feature selection which is still state-of-the-art. And at least in speech speaker identification, we know the pieces of the spectrum which carry the identity. Technically, when you speak, the formant one and two are what carries the vowel. And we know third, fourth, and fifth formants are your specific body resonances, chest, mouth, size of the nasal cavity, so this is your personal information. Technically, you'd look for speaker identification in the upper part of the frequency band. Emotion? We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we literally, I still believe that there is a work to be done around the future set for yes. emotion detection. Ivan? Yes? Hey, that's pretty cool work. On, on, on those areas, for example, as you know, uh, if we try to use Melcapstrom for compression, not doesn't come even close to working because you threw away too much information. But if you try to use more like raw spectrum data, it's 10 to 20 times more data. Then I remember the first question, it gets close to almost the same dimensionality as the input data itself, then it may be too much data. 
But in compression, where we try to have some fidelity to some extent, we prune the data in another way. Instead of reducing the resolution of the spectrum, we basically run an auditory model and predict what are the things you can't hear anyways, assuming humans do a good job, <laughs> which you're actually questioning that as well. <laughs> but assuming humans do a good job, uh, and that auditory masking actually takes away two-thirds of the information. So it's a three-to-one compression that preserves a lot of fidelity of the original information. So I wonder if somebody has done some work along those lines of features closer to the ones we use for compression instead of closer to the ones we use for recognition. It's like acoustic wave. <laughs> Not really. Might be uh, something to try, I guess, yeah. Again, uh, one of the signs that this uh, young area is, you know, the base code, the equivalent of, uh, of HDK in the motion detection, the feature extractor extracts 920 features from every single frame. This is a sure sign that we still don't know what we're doing. <laughs> More questions, colleagues? If not, let's thank our speaker again.